Awesome. Well, good morning. Isn't that great? Well, first off, thank you for choosing Wes this morning. I realize you could have gone to East with the other guy, but uh, no, Colin and I are great friends, and I'm excited for this morning. Um, but we are going to be in John 20. So uh, you can go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle, and they will give you one. If you do not own a Bible, that is yours. Uh, take that home with you. We just want to say that we're glad that you are here. We love you, and we're thankful for you. So take that with you. Um, but I love Prince of Mukamara's story because it sounds a lot like mine, we have some similarities. Not only our uh, NFL caliber level of football skill, but uh, just our story behind the gospel, right? This story of God bringing creation back to himself. And I think there's something there for all of us, right? I think sometimes when it comes to Christianity, we can boil it down to uh, the behavior what we do, what we don't do, the principles, the morals, and all those things are great, but the gospel is so much more than that. And that story is so much more than that. And I'm excited to dig into that with you guys this morning. But it is Super Bowl Sunday. It's a big day in sports. Uh, I uh, myself got to check something off of my bucket list this year when it came to sports. A kind family invited me to go with them to Game 7 of the World Series. Um, and it was awesome. And I just want to say, first off, the whole trash can thing. It is too soon. But I just want to say, for what it's worth, I was up in section 422 and I didn't see anything. So I think we're fine. But there was this cool moment. It was a ton of fun. It was a great game. Uh, but when it came down to the last out and the Nationals won it, there was a father and a son. And they were both in Nationals gear. It was clear that they probably came all the way down from D.C. for this game. And when the final out happened, they got to share this beautiful moment where the father picks up the son and he's just like, we did it. We won the World Series. And they're just having this moment together. Uh, and it was just the worst. Like, that should have been us. <laughs> Like, Ken should have been picking me up in that moment. Uh, but it was a ton of fun. I really did enjoy it, and I do love sports. So this is such a fun day, and I'm excited to be a part of it. So we're going to be in John 20, as I said, verses 19 and 20. Just two verses this morning, uh, but I'm excited to dive into it together. So I'll read it for us, uh, and we'll get going. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Let me pray for us and let's dig into this together. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather here this morning. God, as we dig into the story of the gospel, of what it is and what it isn't, I pray that it would become clear to us and would fall on us in a fresh way. If there are um, those in the room this morning who maybe have never heard of this gospel, the story of you bringing a sinful humanity back to yourself, um, that it would be clear and they would realize that it is for them. And I pray that if there are those in this room who uh, have been a Christian since they can remember, that it would be a reminder that the gospel is more than just about what we do and more than just about principle and morals and behavior. It's about being able to walk in relationship with the one who spoke us into existence, and that is you. So God, I pray that it is clear for all of us as we huddle around the word this morning. Pray all this in your name, amen. Well, I do work with students, which is a ton of fun. Uh, and I, in fact, remember my first day, day one, of going into the student ministry in sixth grade. And the first day, we were doing this serve day, where we were going to go out and do these service projects, but we're starting together by having breakfast, right? Got to get fueled up. And the whole time, I'm kind of nervous, right? It's the first day, but I'm also confident because I'm like, this is the day where I have to make my mark, right? People have to know, like, I'm here as a sixth grader. 
And I'm wearing K-Swiss that day. I'm just feeling it. I'm ready. And as we're eating breakfast, I get done. And then I look over and I see a basketball on the floor. And we're in a gym. Fate has done it again. And I'm thinking to myself, if I were to just drill a half court shot right now, everyone would think I was the greatest person in existence and I would immediately become their leader. And so sixth grade me at the peak of male athleticism, pick up the basketball, go half court, that wasn't good enough, take a few steps back. And then I, I pull back and I let it go. And it is going straight at the basket. And I'm like, this is it. Like, this is it. And then it, it starts to tail just a little bit. And then a lot. <laughs> it has a really big bend to it. And sixth grade noodle armed me decides to throw the greatest curveball since Nolan Ryan. And it's important to point out that whoever was in charge of putting on the logistics of this breakfast had thought through everything. They were very efficient. They were very detailed. And they had the idea, right, that, that we could either all take our cups to a table that had milk and fill it up and go back, or we could just put a gallon of milk at everyone's table. Yeah. And as the Basketball begins to bend. It is locked on to its target. <laughs> Lo and behold, a gallon of milk. And it hits it dead on with the force of a rocket. And it explodes at the table of the senior girls. Thus sums up my dating life <laughs> in high school. <laughs> and it explodes, right? It goes everywhere and they all shoot up and they are covered and everybody's looking around. And then of course, everybody turns and looks at me and I'm just like that, I could have seen that coming. And, and I was just terrified because then the new student pastor who I was getting the opportunity to meet now uh, comes up to me and, and, and pulls me aside and we have a conversation. I'm terrified. Like I just blew it. And he, he pulls me aside and then he said some words to me that I've, nev I've never forgotten. Uh, but he said to me, I can't wait for the day where your peers cease to become your audience and you realize that a relationship with Jesus is what will bring you the fulfillment you're looking for. And I had heard the first part before. That second part was new to me. That concept was different. This relationship with the Jesus from the Bible. To me, Jesus came into the picture with Christianity. I just thought that we were just trying to live a life that lived up to the standard that he set. And it was all about behavior and it was all about these things and, and just trying to live up to that standard. And it was such a new idea that I could actually walk with him in relationship. And I remember this being the clear moment that I truly encountered Christ. And we're going to look at just two verses in this passage where the disciples will encounter Christ in a very new light and then we'll see a change in them. And I'm excited to dig into that this morning, but it's important before we get there to set up the picture, to set up uh, what is going on in this picture right now. And it's important to note that it says that the disciples are locked away in a room for fear for their life because the Jesus that they had been following had staked everything, had put the rest of their lives into saying, this is who we're going to follow. Jesus is the son of God. We see him do these miracles. We've seen all of these things that he's done in the ways that he proved he's the Messiah. He's the one that we've been waiting for, the one who's going to redeem humanity. 
the one who's going to bring humanity back to the Father. And Jesus even says that. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. And then we pick up in this verse in a very shocking turn of events. That Jesus that they had followed, had staked everything in, has just been killed, has been executed publicly. They've witnessed it. And now they're in in, in fear for their life because the same people who just killed the one that they had been following are now coming after them. Right, they're gonna start with the top and then now they're out to kill anyone who has affiliation with that so they completely erase what they see as the problem. So they are completely in fear for their life, but also there's a raw human element of emotion in this passage because you can imagine as they're locked behind this door and they're in this room, there is a cloud of confusion of what just happened. We thought this, this was the guy, we thought this was the son of God, the Messiah, and we just witnessed him die. There's probably a lot of questions that are rattling around in their heads in this moment. And as I was looking into this passage and and thinking about that, and how do we really truly paint the reality of that scene, and this is a fresh thing, but I remember hearing about the death of Kobe Bryant somebody who was an, uh, 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 just a huge role model in my life for many different things and was a role model to a lot of people. And that is fresh and that is real. But I remember hearing the news and thinking, that can't happen. Like, there's no way. And, and, and a lot of people had the same reaction. They're like, this can't, be, this can't be right. And I remember texting Michael Sullivan, our business administrator and a good friend of mine. I was like, did you, did you see this? And he later told me after we talked about it that he was in an airport and saw the news come across the screen as he had gotten my text. And later when we talked about it, we both kind of had the same reaction, which is boiled down to the phrase, this can't be real. There's that raw element of just what happened. Now put yourself in the place of the disciples, the 12 men that Jesus has selected to follow him and to walk in close relationship with him. Can you imagine the sense of this can't be real? (laughs) What happened? The fear, the confusion, the questions. And then Jesus comes into the room. And they have a true encounter with Christ in a very different way. It says that when he came into the room and said, peace be with you. It says that they were glad. They were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. But in the original text, they were beside themselves. They could not keep their composure. They lost themselves in that moment. Not just because they had been mourning him and now he's alive. There's something much deeper going on there because the questions are rattling around in their head. I thought he was this person. I thought he said he was this. I thought he said he was going to redeem humanity. I thought he said he was the only way back to God. I thought he was all of these things. And then when he comes into the room for them, it is a moment of this, if he is here right now, then Jesus is who he said he was. And if he's alive right now, then everything that he said was true. And it changed everything for them. And I I love this because you look at the setting before it, and it's a gloomy, dark overcast, pretty hopeless. And you think about it, the thing is, they had his teachings. They had his words, they walked with him. Many of them would later pin those on paper. They had all of these things, but the true encounter and the change for them came when he entered the room. And for us this morning, the principles are good of Christianity. 
Are Jesus' teachings important? A thousand percent. They changed the landscape of the course of history. The principles are good, but the person is everything. If you have the principles, but you're missing the person, you're missing everything. The gospel is just, it's not just about your behavior and what you do. The gospel goes far deeper than that. And Jesus accomplished something far greater by dying on the cross. That Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, went to a cross willingly to be the final offering, the sacrifice in our place. And it said that before he took his last breath and hung his head, he uttered the words, it is finished. And then when he hung his head, the earth shook. There was a shaking of the earth, not just like a what was that, a great shaking of the foundation of the earth. And there was this place called the temple of the holy of holies. And the temple was the center of everyone's life at that time. But in this temple, there was this thing called the veil, a curtain. It was huge. It was massive. It was heavy. And it was also a very real, tangible barrier of the separation of a sinful man and a holy God. So much so that if you crossed that veil and you were with sin, you would drop dead in the presence of a holy God. And it said that when he said it is finished and he hung his head and there was a shaking of the earth, that veil from top to bottom split. Signifying what Jesus had just accomplished that now sinful man can step into the presence and walk with a holy God. How often do I forget that? We have that opportunity every single day as we open our Bibles, as we drive, as we go to work, as we do all of these things to walk with the one who spoke you into existence on purpose. And the disciples had this encounter with Christ in that light. And it changed everything for them. Not just their demeanor, not just their sense of hope, It changed their entire state of being. It changed their entire purpose. They now lived with purpose. How do we know that? Because the same men who were cowering in a a room behind a locked door in fear for certain people went out and proclaimed the truth of who Jesus was to those same people and were willing to die for it. And in fact, did. And men don't die for what they don't believe in. It changed everything for them. It gave them purpose. And that's the beautiful second part of the gospel. Not not only does God just redeem us and, and bring us to life, now we have life to the fullest because he has a purpose for you, individually, uniquely, for you. And you now get to start the lifelong process of stepping more and more into that purpose that he has for you. And I saw that from the moment my student pastor told me that I could have a relationship with Christ, I saw myself start to step into it more and more. And I I will be honest with you. When it comes to that purpose, I did not think that I would be doing what I'm doing. I had other plans for my life. This has been the most fulfilling chapter of my entire life. as I've stepped more and more into the unique purpose that God has had for me. And years will probably look different. But you have that opportunity to have life, to walk with the Jesus from this passage that entered into a room and changed everything. And you have the opportunity to walk in the purpose that God has for you specifically. Maybe you're sitting there this morning and you have never heard this. This is new. This concept of even though I'm with sin, I can walk in in a relationship with this same Jesus who knows me and loves me. And maybe for you this morning, 
You're sitting out there and you have been pursuing the principles and you have been pursuing the morals and the behavior and all these things which are good, but you may realize that you have been missing the person completely from that. I pray that you would realize that opportunity that you have. That scripture is clear that in an instant, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved and you can start walking with him and you can start walking into the purpose that he has for you and it will be the most fulfilling thing of your life because just as I learned and just as my student pastor told me, walking in a relationship with Christ has brought me the fulfillment that I've been searching for my whole life. And I hope that you will encounter the same Christ from this passage. And I hope you will begin walking in the purpose and discovering and seeking the purpose that he has for you.